Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we'll be looking at more prayers of the faith, and this time, the Dies Irae. Now, the Dies Irae was a poem that dates back to at least the 1200s, possibly longer, and has since been used as a sequence, chant, and hymn, most often at Masses for the Dead, which are called Requiem Masses. This particular poem, along with some others, has been much less widely used since the Second Vatican Council in the late 60s because, apparently, they thought it was negative. As you might be able to tell from the title, it was originally written in Latin. Because of this, the poem rhymes in the original Latin, but not when translated directly into English. There is also an English translated version, which is designed to carry most of the same meaning, but that's not what we'll be going over today. Today we're going to look at a near direct translation of what the original Latin words meant. Here we go. The day of wrath, that day will dissolve the world in ashes, David being witness along with the Sibyl. A few things to cover here. The term day of wrath refers to the last day, the final judgment. Ashes come after a fire, which is the Christian view of how the earth will end, according to 2 Peter 3.10. Even if that fire doesn't leave ashes in the literal sense, that's definitely what they're referring to. David refers, of course, to King David, and the Sibyls were Greek oracles who made predictions about the future. That third line seems to be saying that Jews and non-Jews alike, even those who've already died, will witness the final judgment. How great will be the quaking when the judge is about to come, strictly investigating all things. Quaking here refers to the fear of those who've refused to repent. By this point, the earth is gone, and they're standing before Jesus, who is the judge mentioned here, a fair and just judge, who will make sure not to miss anything when he renders his verdicts. The trumpet, scattering a wondrous sound through the sepulchres of the regions, will summon all before the throne. This imagery of a trumpet being used to summon everyone before Jesus at the final judgment is found in the Bible itself, in 1 Corinthians 15.52. Death and nature will marvel when the creature will rise again to respond to the judge. To rise from the dead is contrary to the rules of both death and nature as we understand them, but it will happen to every person after the end of earth, so that they can appear before Jesus. The written book will be brought forth, in which all is contained, from which the world shall be judged. This is probably a reference to Revelation 20.12, where the book of life is brought out and people are judged according to their works. When, therefore, the judge will sit, whatever lies hidden will appear, nothing will remain unpunished. Judges sit to hear cases, so this refers to Jesus judging each person. Unlike other judges, however, Jesus knows everything, so no matter how well the evidence for a crime may be hidden, it won't escape his eye, and hiding won't stop him from delivering true justice for crimes committed. However, when it says that nothing will remain unpunished, this doesn't say who will be punished. As it says in Isaiah 53, 5, he was bruised for our sins, and by his bruises were healed. What then will I, poor wretch that I am, say? Which patron will I entreat, when even the just may only hardly be sure? No matter who we are, or who our friends are, there is no leverage that allows people to escape from justice in the face of the final judgment, and no rhetoric that can fool Jesus into making an incorrect judgment. King of fearsome majesty, who gladly saves those fit to be saved, save me, O font of mercy. God is indeed awesome in his power and glory, but he's also eager to show mercy to those who seek it. Remember, merciful Jesus, that I am the cause of your journey, lest you lose me in that day. Seeking me, you rested, tired. You redeemed me, having suffered the cross. Let not such hardship be in vain. The person saying or singing this is a sinner who's repented, and it's precisely for the penitent that Jesus went to all the trouble of coming to earth and dying on the cross. The sinner pleads with Jesus to remember this and show him mercy. Just judge of vengeance, make a gift of remission before the day of reckoning. The sinner asks for the gift of forgiveness before the time of the final judgment comes. I sigh, like the guilty one, my face reddens in guilt. Spare the imploring one, O God. The sinner confesses their guilt and asks to be saved. You who absolved Mary and heard the robber gave hope to me also. 
Mary, the mother of Jesus, was not absolved of any sins because she never sinned. This part refers to Mary Magdalene. In Luke 7.47, Jesus said that her sins were many, but that he had forgiven them. The robber being referred to here is one of the thieves who was crucified with Jesus, but admitted his guilt while hanging on the cross in Luke 23, 39-43, and who Jesus promised would be with him in paradise on that very day. Since these two can be forgiven, the sinner also hopes for forgiveness. My prayers are not worthy, but all oh, you who are good, graciously grant that I be not burned up by the everlasting fire. We don't deserve to be forgiven. Jesus forgives sinners because he is worthy to do so, and because those sinners have agreed to comply with his plan to forgive them by admitting their sinfulness and asking forgiveness. Grant me a place among the sheep, and take me out from among the goats, setting me on the right side. This part refers to the parable of the sheep and the goats found in Matthew 25, 31-46. It even says, setting me on the right side, which refers to how God set the sheep on his right hand in the parable, with the goats being on his left hand. Once the cursed have been silenced, sentenced to acrid flames, call me with the blessed. Blessed and cursed refer, of course, to those who God saves by bringing them to heaven, and those who choose not to be saved. Humbly kneeling and bowed, I pray, my heart crushed as ashes, take care of my end. Translation, it's totally not the journey, it's the destination that matters. If God doesn't take care of us at the end of our lives, all the greatness in the world won't mean a thing. Tearful will be that day, on which from the glowing embers will arise the guilty man who is to be judged. Then spare him, O God. If the guilty man is spared by Jesus, there will be tears of joy. Merciful Lord Jesus, grant them rest. Amen. Rest, in this case, refers to the rest of God, referred to by Genesis 2, 2, and expanded on in Psalm 94, 11, as a place that people won't enter if they don't know the ways of Jesus. This is further expanded on in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, with more information about what's needed in order to enter the rest of God. Since this rest can be entered, it must be a destination of some sort, but not necessarily a state of inactivity. So in short, the Dies Irae is all about recognizing the greatness of God, our own personal guilt, and our need for repentance and forgiveness before the final judgment. Next time, what's the meaning of the Regina Celi? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.